just making sure everything is up and running hello hello my dearest peace lovers and peacemakers i'm sarah jamshidi with matin rochsefat welcome to peace mindedly a podcast show featuring peaceful bridge makers featuring peaceful bridge makers our guests that we uh, we are so honored to have on peace mindedly are the people who are connecting cultures connecting bridging bridging uh, people and languages and and trying to explain oftentimes trying to explain this connectedness and we are absolutely thrilled and so honored to have our guests uh, in in peace mindedly so you know the deal we are live streaming our show on many social media channels and also on many podcast channels extremely easy to find us just type peace mindedly podcast and there you go we are there just in front of your eyes uh, we are today's is is the first Tuesday of March and we are live streaming our show in Seattle. It's noon um, uh, Pacific Standard Time. One of our guests, Professor Fatima Sadigi, is joining us from Germany and Professor Aili Mari Tripp is joining us from, uh, from DC. So Germany is around 9 p.m. and DC is around 3 p.m. And we are absolutely thrilled to have them. Before inviting them on the screen uh, to join the conversation, I would like to just explain the, uh, the uh, perhaps latitude of this program and and what we have what we have you uh, for this show and for this episode so today's today we are focusing on uh, women and women issues very very specifically international women's day so international women's day is just around the corner on march 8th uh, many countries around the world uh, celebrate uh, women's uh, women's rights women's issues and 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 Women's Day. And for, for the sake of this show, we are going to focus on one particular region. It's called Maghreb. Uh, Maghreb includes, uh, I believe, five countries. We are going to uh, focus on the three of the major countries, Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria. And for that, we have two beautiful scholars. Before uh, sending, uh, t I mean, spending time explaining all of those, I really very quickly would like to explain what is International Women's Day and why we celebrate it, why we celebrate International Women's Day. So uh, so this day is dedicated to celebrate women's achievement in across the globe, women's achievement across the globe. And then, and then it's a day to bond with sisters who are fighting against um, gender inequality and gender parity gender parity. Gender parity is a, st a statistical measure, compares men and women in different areas. Areas include economy, income, include uh, work hours, and include education. And then by studying and comparing uh, these, uh, these areas, scientists oftentimes learn about uh, the, the sort of society's progress or regress of uh, on on women's issues and women movement and also gender parity helps lawmakers and politicians to perhaps draft law uh, accordingly according to the uh, to the need and we are going to discuss that whether or not um, that serves uh, women uh, within uh, their respected countries or not serve women within their respected countries and then international women's day uh, draw uh, in, in this day uh, we draw attention to uh, two women who are um, celebrating celebrating women's achievement and for that I do have two amazing guests uh, Professor Eileen Mari Tripp I'm bringing her to the screen hello hello Eileen hi Hello, excellent. Yes, is uh, Wangari Matai, Professor of P uh, Political Science, Gender and Women's Studies. She is also the Chair of Department of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Tripp just published her latest book. So I do have the book with me and my, my, my audience always asks, so please show the book. So this is the book, Seeking, Seeking Legitimacy, Why Arab Autocracies Adopt women's rights. Uh, she has received numerous awards and honors for the body of her work. Very welcome, Aili. Very good to have you here. 
Thank you very much. Absolutely. May I ask you, please, when you speak, you speak a bit louder, so then we have a clearer voice. Awesome. And I do have with me joining us Fatima Sadiqi. Yes, Fatima Sadiri, she is a professor of linguistic and gender studies at the University of Fez in Morocco. Also co-founder of the International Institute for Languages and Cultures, Sadiqi was selected by UNESCO as one of the 70 best worldwide public speakers on Middle East and North Africa women's issues. She has written many books, including Moroccan feminist discourse. Very welcome, Fatima. Thank you. Very Excellent. happy to be here. Thank you. Excellent. It's an honor. It's absolutely an yeah. honor. Okay, so I am super curious and I would love to know what happened, why you decided to, to focus on uh, Maghreb and to focus on women issues and women's rights within the Maghreb region. So I wonder who would like to go first? Well, I could start. <laughs> absolutely. Yes, go ahead, Aili. I think my path was a little different than Fatima's, but uh, I um, I grew up in Tanzania. I lived there 15 years, and uh, my mother was an anthropologist, uh, so I I often went with her to do research, and it was among a very you know a local um, Muslim Saramo society. Uh, she was studying rituals and symbols, and so I went to many different um, uh, on weekends, going to initiation ceremonies and divinations and weddings and so on. And these were some of the poorest women in the world, but they led a very rich, symbolic and ritual life. And so I learned to appreciate things that many people overlooked um, because they only saw people as poor, but not as pe people with humanity that, that we had a lot to learn from. Um, these this Zoramo people that I worked, that we lived among, they cared about the old, uh, they cared about each other. When you greeted somebody, you acknowledged their existence. When somebody was sick, you know, everybody participated in their healing um, through through rituals because they saw healing as a social problem, not just a physical individual one. And so women played a, a central role in these in these healing uh, ceremonies. Anyway, what got me interested <laughs> eventually was um, how knowledge is created and and, but it also gave me a real deep understanding uh, um, and a lasting interest in how diverse um, cultures, um, you know, I mean, appreciation for for uh, the diversity of culture. So, uh, to make a long story perhaps a little shorter, um, I continued then to do research when I, I eventually went to university and continued to do research in on uh, women's movements and women in politics in Africa, but primarily sub-Saharan Africa. So, in Uganda, in Angola, in Liberia, uh, and. Eventually, I wanted to also incorporate North Africa, um, partly because I had seen that in sub-Saharan Africa, many of the um, Muslim majority countries were some of the earliest to promote women as political leaders. Uh, Tanganyika was one of the had um, the main leaders of the independence movement were uh, again Muslim women from the coastal area, Bibi Titi among them. Uh, today, some of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa that have the highest rate of women in parliament, one of them is Senegal with 44% of So them. basically, everything happened way, way before you conducted the research. Have, have, I mean, started when you were with your mom in the region and just got got interested into into just studying is basically what's happening. It was a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing. Fatima, I wonder what is your story? So what happened that you you got interested in uh, women's rights and, and studying women's rights and women's movement in, in Morocco and Maghreb? Well, a mixture of a lot of things. Um, most importantly, I think, is the fact that I grew up in a Muslim Berber family. Uh, I have a rural background. And um, at school, I, uh, as a girl, I learned that to be modern, I had to uh, learn and uh, master French. And to be a good Muslim, I needed Arabic. So I became a linguist because I wanted to um, like find a place um, for Berber in my linguistic word, Berber Amazigh. My generation uses uh, Berber, but my students now use Amazigh. Um, we call ourselves Amazigh, but I have no problem with uh, 
like uh, using the two. And um, well, at school, we didn't know anything about, we didn't hear, learn anything about Berber. So I became very much um, uh, interested in finding out about Berber. And one of the things I found out is that just to join what Ailey was saying, there is the, the link between Morocco and Sub-Saharan Africa is Berber. Now, th that's, one of, well, that's one part. One may be related in a very complex way is the fact that I am a woman. So as a girl, I, I felt the difference, of course. I mean, uh, I am the first woman to go to school in my family. And um, I realized how difficult it is. So uh, I internalized all that. And later on, when I, I got more uh, experience and more knowledge, I tried to link the two in my life, like Berber, and women and uh, that's how i became uh, more interested and uh, uh, about north africa and most of what i learned was i uh, were not things i learned at school uh-huh the things that you didn't yeah. learn at school so for the i had of to, i had to talk so to, to talk to women my own family i had to find out sorry to interrupt you to uh find out these things myself and that's that's what made my life exciting at least for me tell me yeah. uh, so you had to find your way to explain things within your family what do you mean that is, why is it that I grew up thinking that I belong very proud of my ancestry, my grandfather and all that. And then suddenly I learned that I had to hide that for a long time because uh, it's only recently that Berber became an official language. But what people don't know is the long struggle before. So for me, like the struggle for women's rights and struggle for Berber rights, they go hand in hand. Excellent. Language is very important, and and, and Berber was uh, was marginalized just like women. And we had the new family law and Berber, an official language, almost synchronically. So Excellent. The so things, be, the two things, yeah, be, uh, are very clear in my mind that there is this relationship that I'm very much interested in. Awesome. As a, feminist linguist yeah awesome so feminist linguist we are going to go back come back to this idea of so how words and meaning of words and inter interpretation of words really influence policy making and law making within uh, within um, social political spectrum we are going to come back to that but Aili, i am interested so in your opinion what do we gain what do we gain of paying a specific attention to to women to women's rights and to women's movements so why why this can be an important issue for us you think yeah i mean i think that uh, we can all, especially looking at things comparatively and looking at things, um, looking at some of these issues across countries, we can really learn uh, how other countries have, and other parts of the world have have dealt with similar issues and how they've, um, you know, what kind of tactics and strategies they've used uh, to to uh, improve the status of women, uh, and. Uh, so it's a you know I, there's, a, there's a lot to there's a lot to be learned from each other and I think that that's you know why I do comparative work I don't focus always so much on one country but I try to look at patterns across countries to see why some countries have done better than other countries um, in terms of uh, advancing women's rights. Excellent. And so for the sake of um, c controlling the sound and the sound quality uh, from your side, there is because our um, equipment here is a bit sensitive. And from your side, uh, there is just probably uh, the um, scratch of papers or something that we can hear it on our end. Okay. So, yeah, I just wanted to mention that because we are recording, be, be mindful about that. You mentioned something, something important. So, um we are comparing in your book you are comparing is what's happening in algeria and tunisia and morocco what are the um, similarities what are the similarities between these um, distinct nations in terms of women's rights uh -huh. well one of the first things that struck me was that they were passing uh, legislation more or less in sync at the same time 
uh, around uh, quotas for women in parliament. Uh, they were passing uh, legislation around um, citizenship rights, um, the ability for women to pass uh, their citizenship to their children or to their husband. Uh, in the past, it was only men that could do that. Uh, they were passing legislation around violence against women. And what was interesting was that these things were happening almost at the same, not the same time, but a few years apart. And they were learning a lot from each other and borrowing from each other. And so a lot of this had to do with the fact that the women's movement, um, they were organizations of women, um, Collective Egalite um, Maghreb, that were working together and were coordinating and had a blueprint for, for, each, for, for the region. And so this is why, you know, they, it wasn't just only the women's movement, but their impact on their governments that allowed for uh, many of these uh, similarities uh, in, in timing of, this, of the, the legislation being passed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Many of the similarities in allowing this legislation to pass. So I, um, I know Fatima that you are from Morocco, and yeah. you know the country really well, and also had uh, comparative studies uh, within the Maghreb about what's going on um, in the region. So I wonder, um, and also you, you know about the larger Middle East. I wonder, is there similarities between what's going on in Maghreb and uh, probably the Middle East and and women's movement in the Middle East? Uh, the, first of all, just to uh, follow up with that, what Ailey uh, said, uh, yeah, women uh, not only did that brilliantly, what uh, Ailey said, that they uh, coordinated their efforts, but also they knew that their governments uh, could not su survive without uh, their movement because of the history of, uh, of North Africa, of the region, which is, uh, and here I uh, address your question, uh, rather different from the Middle East. That's, that's another thing that I learned uh, uh, when doing research on Berber is that the Berber is actually what differentiates um, uh, North Africa from the Middle East. That's the main difference. And that's the only link with the Mediterranean and the only remaining link with the Mediterranean and with Sub-Saharan Africa, which uh, I mean, uh, we don't find in, in, in the Middle East. Now, uh, the main difference, uh, yeah, so th there are differences. First of all, in terms of, um, of uh, women's rights, uh, the Maghreb is at the forefront, but we should be very careful here. I mean, there is uh, what uh, I mean when I say women are at the forefront in terms of law, what's written on paper. Um, women are very heterogeneous. They are not homogeneous. There are differences of class, of uh, uh, education, of um, uh, skills, of uh, social status, etc. We are we are divided by many. Uh, social categories. But as, as a group, if you look at us as a group, I think that um, North African women are at the forefront of, uh, middle, uh, of women in the larger Middle East and North Africa. And that's one big difference between the two the two regions, in addition to history, because even, uh, I mean, if you look at the Islam of, uh, of uh, North Africa, it's different from the Islam of the Middle East, Absolutely. Again, because it had to adapt to the Berber tribal system. Adapt, adapt, this is the main it had point, to adapt. adapt. Yep. And yeah, then because this the Berbers is... were the indigenous populations, so they had and... to adapt to it. And the Berbers were the ones to spread Islam, and they are the, they're still the ones to continue doing that but they give it this flavor which is uh, indigenous and which can only be different from uh, so, so from the Middle East. here is the question why do why adapt why adaptation why do arab leaders in the maghreb need to um, adapt women's rights within within their um, um, uh, sphere, whatever sphere that they are working, Ailey, this is this is the basis of your book. So why do they need to adapt uh, to women's rights? You think maybe before before Ailey yes. answers, if you don't mind, yes, uh, and I I don't want to forget this. Uh, for me, the way I see it, Ailey is a social. Um, she's a, she, she's a, um, like a social scientist. scientist. Uh, yeah, was, so. Um, Adapt because Berbers, I forgot to mention that they are united by language. 
-hmm. but they are different, they are separated by religion before Islam. They, 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 they are different tribal ways of um, uh, worshipping God and goddesses and so on. So Islam had to adapt to that. It's just I wanted to make that uh, clear. That uh, yeah, Islam needed to adapt to uh, the to Berber the way of living. To the Berber way of worshiping. Uh huh. Berber way of worshiping. Yeah. So the so the goddesses disappeared, god and goddesses. But they had, but they did not really disappear. They went into our unconscious. They're still living there. So. Um, uh, that's why women are important in Berber cultures, and uh, they are very poorly known. Uh, but I mean, leave women um, apart outside in the public sphere. Islam had to be had to uh, because um, um, uh, when Arab, let's say, it, when Arabs uh, reached North Africa, they didn't bring their wives, so they had to marry indigenous wives. Okay, we agree with that. So I mean, and the women are the ones who carry religion. So religion continued mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. Islam, but Islam had to adapt. Mm -hmm. if you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Fight the tribes for political reasons. And now we are talking about adaptation Pre of yes. Arab yes. autocracies to yeah. uh, to no, women's no, rights. You know, this is history. This is history. This is history. With which we don't know, but which helps us, it helps us uh, understand the situation now. Mm -hmm. So we are going to go back to Berber and the uh, power of word and power of language. But uh, we are talking about adaptation, Aili. And I would like to know, uh, so what happened? And in what, in uh, one sphere, we are talking about how Islam adapts uh, itself against this uh, new culture. And now we are talking about how Arab uh, leaders need to adapt to women's rights. So why do we need this kind of... Um, 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 uh, flow. Oh, about as happened? eloquently as as Fatima did, but um, I think that what you know, one of the things that I I was looking at was more from a sociological perspective or, or political science perspective, um, and looking at some of the differences that have emerged um, be, as a result of these uh, adaptations that took place in the Maghreb, and 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 how they're very different than some of these some of what's evolved in the Middle East, even though there's similarities in religion and in language and in, um, you know, they all had colonial histories and so on. Um, so there's many similarities between the two regions, the Maghreb and the Middle East, but also many important differences. And one of the areas where there are differences have to do with uh, the, some of the laws that have been adopted in the Maghreb countries. So for example, even though there's still important limitations in family law in both regions. One sees much, you know, much bigger, big differences between the regions and in family law, for example. So in um, the only countries in the Middle East and North Africa that have, that have limited um, polygamy are, um, to, are Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria, and Tunisia already in 1956, but it's, but it's restricted in Morocco and Algeria. Um, Algeria and Tunisia um, allow women to pass their citizenship, like I said, to their husbands and children. In Morocco, it's, it's, uh, they can pass the citizenship to their children. Uh, women can travel outside of the, uh, the country in these three countries, uh, but, they, um, but in the rest of the region, they, in, the, in the Middle East, they have to get permission from their husbands with the exception of um, uh, Lebanon and now Saudi Arabia. Uh, the same thing, the abortion laws are more lenient in these three countries. Um, although Tunisia is the only one that allows for abortions without restriction. Um, Tunisia same, allows Tunisia allows abortion yeah, without restriction. Very, That's amazing. Yeah, they got it the same year that we did in the U.S. Oh, my God. Uh, Maghreb countries, they also have um, very extensive legislation around, a comprehensive legislation around violence against women. Uh, and again, it's the only, these are the only countries that have that. So it's a, it's a big difference uh, when you move into politics and look at the and overall the leadership. Um, okay, United Arab Emirates has now recently has now 50% women in the parliament, but um, but overall, if you look at the numbers of women, like in Tunisia, 49% of the local councils are um, member are, are uh, have women. Um, if you look at the cabinet, if you look at the parliament, 
overall, the, the Maghreb countries have done better and, and they, they came into this earlier than the Middle East countries. So it's a big difference. And so it's it, one can't just lump this whole region, everything together. And I think a lot of it has to do, I mean, it's, I think the, the Berber factor is one element of why, we, why we've seen this difference. I've looked at more contemporary reasons for why, uh, you know, how, how they evolved then and how they manifested later on. Um, One thing that really struck me when I was reading the book was the the fact that um, uh, there was influence of colonial um, uh, power in the region, French uh, colonial power, and the fact that I, I was just trying to find the exact page. I wish I I had it handy, but um, the just just recently, the French passed the law so then women can have a, a property. Um, uh, property right and that really influenced as, as much as I understood so I, I, I was wondering what was the French influence in the region and how really shaped helped or not helped um, uh, in terms of women's movement in the region mm -hmm. Riley, go ahead okay um, well in terms of not helping um, one of the things that the French did and Fatima knows this better than I do but they had different laws for the Berbers for the Arabs for the French and so the the, the legal system made it almost impossible to reform family law so one of the first things that all three countries did almost you know around the same time, after independence was to create a unified legal system and a unified laws. And this laid the basis then for later on, allowing for uh, changes in the personal status code, much more extensive changes than you would find in the, in the Middle East countries. Uh, it wasn't the only, it wasn't the only um, reason why we saw these changes, but it was an important one. Uh, in terms of other um, factors, I think that Fatima can speak better to, there was a the feminist movement was influenced very much. Many people traveled to France and were influenced by through uh, by the French feminists and French socialists so that had some impact. Um, but also one could maybe talk about the, there's an extensive migration between this region and, and Europe and France in particular, and maybe there were influences in, in that regard as well. But I will defer to, <laughs> to Fatima. Yes, yeah, so Fatima, yeah. would you think that clo uh, well, French colonialism yeah. helped your hurt? I think uh, no. I think the the, the French uh, colonizers uh, colonized. Let me say the French colonized Morocco through language, through mm -hmm. education. When they put uh, when uh, French became obligatory in primary education, the first year I went to school was French Arabic. So uh, that was the, the, that was the way that the French used to colonize through education, through language. That's one thing. The other thing is that it's true that for the first generation of uh, Moroccan educated men and women, the French socialist intelligentsia was um, like a role model because they put a lot of pressure on their governments so that their governments gives uh, independence to the countries of the Maghreb. That's something, uh, I am not saying that colonization is never a good thing, but I'm trying to understand why is it that um, uh, the first, um, the, the first um, uh, uh, Moroccan intelligentsia was really influenced by the French socialist um, uh, academics and writers and uh, artists and so on, because they were anti, they were, uh, they put pressure on De Gaulle at that time, uh, so De Gaulle to uh, grant independence to Moroccans. Uh, so far as women are concerned, the French language, because uh, it is stripped from, um, its database is, is stripped from religion, and like Arabic, uh, so French was, it was easier for women to say taboo words in French, to express sexuality in French. That's why many, um, uh, many writers, the first writers, Bernice is one of them, uh, they used French. <clears throat> and when she was asked on television, why do you write in French? I mean, uh, French colonized your country and you are not French. She said, well, I didn't go to French. French came to me. And another intellectual, I think he was from Algeria, he said, I think it's Katib Yassin, 
they asked him, why is it uh, that you write in, in French and all your writings <coughs> are uh, against uh, colonization? He said, I write in French so that the French know that I am not French. <laughs> Exactly. So oftentimes when I get too, so angry, I, yeah. I try to speak in English and not <laughs> in Farsi because in English I can control my anger <laughs> compared Husband to Farsi. Husband and wife do that all the time. Comes out. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to uh, ask this question and we go to mid-program. It's... Um, um, what, uh, uh, an example that uh, plays into the power of words and why words are important in uh, probably in politics and social um, uh, social platform. So I'm going to give you a very specific example. Back in Tehran, I was working for Zan newspaper. Zan in Farsi means woman. And then the head of the newspaper for the first time ever in the Middle East region was a woman. That woman, Faeze Hashemi Rafsanjani. Faeze was the daughter of the late former reformist president. She was also the um, uh, parliament representative. It was this big, big argument. And she, she was she a was woman advocate, she was a woman activist, and she was just doing so much uh, in, in the arena of um, moving women's rights forward by drafting laws, by putting forward lots of activism and so forth. And uh, Zan newspaper was one of those. So I was working with Faiz very, very closely. Uh, going to parliament, covering all of those stories about women and so forth. So it was this big argument in the parliament at the time. We are talking about 1997, 98, 99, that um, especially in 97, they were just uh, women were trying to figure out whether or not the Iran's um, uh, political hierarchy allowed them to nominate themselves for presidency. And they were arguing over one particular word, one word. That one particular word was Rajol. Rajol yeah. in Arabic means man, and Rajol means uh, men. So they were arguing, probably many women, they were arguing that so when we have Rajol in constitution, it means human. Doesn't mean man. So therefore, women can nominate themselves for presidency. It's not only in male's domain. And men were saying that, no, no, this is Arabic, this is from Quran, and this is, uh, it relates to men, and only men can be president. So it was a big, big discussion. I want to, by, by just um, uh, uh, playing out this example, I just want to know, in your opinion, how much words and, 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 and um, language really um, plays out in terms of giving meaning or challenging some of the status quo uh, within the, this, this women's movements that we are talking about in Maghreb. Fatima, I go with you first and then yeah. with, with Aili. Well, uh, words are like human beings and uh, they don't have the same status. Uh, some words uh, travel from culture to culture with no problem, like television, for example, television in, in French. Um, every Moroccan knows what it is. Every Moroccan knows what television means, what radio means, etc. So some words travel, no problem with that. But some words have a lot of semantic um, baggage in them. And one of them is gender. Gender, this word, I mean, like human beings, I mean, it's stopped at the frontier and uh, it's searched and uh, sometimes it's accepted, sometimes it's not. The same thing with feminism. I think that words are very important because uh, now we are struggling with what to call feminism in Arabic. Until now, we don't have, uh, like uh, we say, Nasawiya, Niswaniya, Jinsaniya. Jins, it has some sexuality there, so people, uh -huh, they don't like it. So that's, that's where why French helped a lot there. So um, 
when you use Arabic because it's the language of the Quran, the language of the religion, it's not easy to uh, to express. Um, now, the rajul that you uh, struggled with, but there is another word in Arabic, which is insan, that's person. It's mm -hmm. both men and women. So uh, the insan is both men and women. So there are, there are some very good uh, um, words in Arabic that really uh, uh, serve our purposes, but some of them, a gender, a gender is a linguistic term. It started with grammarians, um, masculine and feminine gender. But when it uh, became uh, associated women, women's rights and gender and so on, it became a problem. It, it's a complex word. And uh, until now, I mean, um, it's no, it's no ishtimai. People don't know what to call it. And when you use gender, then it's like you are uh, copying the West, the West in general, I know, the mainstream West. So uh, we have uh, the pro a problem with these words. So w words, they carry concepts. In them. Uh, they are the, the window of a much bigger thing behind. And that concept, uh, th there's history in it, there's religion in it, there is belief, there is um, yourself. We relate to, to words in, 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 in very uh, complicated and complex ways. Uh, that's why... Um, um, I remember when we wanted to um, to reform the, the family law, I, uh, the time that was spent on just choosing the right word took much better, more, longer than uh, actually the ishtihad, looking at the text and trying to find different meanings. Because how to package it, that's the problem. And even the king, when he presented the family law, the way he packaged it in I am not going to make something that's Islamic illicit or make something that illicit illicit or something that is he used the proper language and everybody agreed on that. Uh, whereas a socialist before him during the first socialist government, he was very blunt and he went into gender feminism and so on without uh, talking about religion. It was refused. Actually, it, it instigated, started a big row debate between the Islamists and the secularists. So especially at this age, after the so-called Arab Spring, every word means something, every word. You cannot imagine, even when I speak now, I have been um, writing on Berber for a long time, but uh, even today, I mean, people would stop me and say, no, 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 don't use that word. And they would go into giving you like uh, uh, 10 or 20 arguments why. So exactly. you see, so words are important in a multilingual setting like uh, the Maghreb. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And we are talking about the power of words. Aili, what was your experience? Well, actually, I would like to draw some parallels with the U.S. because it's an issue here, too. Um, we've had long debates in the, in the feminist movement around using terms that some say, oh, you can just use the word congressman or fire fireman. But Again, um, it, it, there's a certain weight that comes with that and, and a so, an association that only men can be in politics or only men can take certain kinds of jobs like being a firefighter. And so there's been a, a gradual acceptance of the term firefighter instead of fireman, Congress. Um, woman and, and mm -hmm. congressman um, here. And it's, and it, but it comes from the same issue that Fatima was talking about that um, that these words have power and they have meaning and they have associations and those associations uh, create realities <laughs> in, yeah. and, and create gender gendered for example gendered professions mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, you know try, being it pay, changing the language uh, makes people more conscious of uh, the inequalities and the divisions of labor and the exclusions that women face. Absolutely. You just gave an example uh, in the U.S. that how we are I mean, trying to um, deepen a meaning or uh, deepen a meaning within with, with words. I wonder if in your research, did you come, come across any phrase or words that you thought uh, has been debated for a long time in the Maghreb, Aili? I think that Fatima is the, the linguist here, yeah. and I think she has better examples than yeah. I on that this well, area. Yeah, well, spontaneously, the word North Africa. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, until now, yeah, it's, uh, because in the U.S., I think it's Northern Africa, which uh, which maybe is the use. I had this experience when I was writing women right in Africa. We didn't know whether we should call it North Africa or Northern Africa, and we were Maghrebi, but also U.S. scholars working together, and uh, North Africa. And when I go to the U.S., and the one thing I always ask, why aren't there uh, enough North African studies in the U.S.? That's why a book like Ailey's makes me personally very happy, uh, knowing that people out there are uh, are uh, writing about North Africa. Val Mugaddam also from Iran, she is interested in, in, in it. And Munira Sharra, these women, for me, I mean, it's not because Ailey is here, it's just personal. I uh, say to myself, it's like I'm discovering Berber, that, that fa- uh, this nice, fan- fantastic enchantment. So people are talking about North Africa at long last, because in a very recent experience, I don't want to um, uh, say what it is. I had this uh, this long discussion uh, with a very established uh, American scholar about why is it uh, she didn't want to have North Africa, it's just the Middle East. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and it, it, I don't know. So it's this world, which mm-hmm. I am, I wish I can, um, live enough uh, to see North African studies have um, more, more dignity in academia. In, inshallah. In we yes. say inshallah. In US <laughs> academy. I, I know that, yeah, they're prospering in Europe, but in, in uh, because maybe I write in English, I would love to see the world uh, being, uh, having it, the dignity it, it, uh, it merits, it deserves. In the study, because there are things there. A lot of people are interested, but we need some kind of movement that would have this, uh, not a movement, but uh, I am hopeful that uh, maybe sometime we will have African studies, North African studies. There there are lots of people who have done, there's a wealth of of literature in the region itself about women in the region and the women. And women, I mean, in politics, there's a lot written, but it's in the region, and people don't know about it outside. And I'm just wondering, you know, is, is it a language issue? Because is that is it partly because French and and uh, Arabic dominate, and and also Berber dominate so much? The, the Maghreb is that why it's it's somehow cut off from? It's I, I, it's because of this term of decolonization. Mm-hmm. They want it to be in the native language. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, I mean, for someone who wants to bridge between cultures like myself, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think it's good to translate. It's good to have all these languages. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, it's from different points of view without, uh, I mean, meaning any harm or anything. They just... Um, but there's a lot, a lot of information in, in, in the books uh, that are written in Arabic, you cannot imagine, yeah. or French, mm-hmm. especially Arabic. I am looking now at Islamic feminism and what's written in Arabic is really some fantastic. Mm-hmm. But we need, we need, I think that if there is, this is my own naive point of view, if there is a recognition of these things as, outside i mean uh, things will move i don't know maybe maybe but we need i agree with you ailey i mean it's there's a lot of things we need to make visible there's no visibility about, uh, Ladies. What, uh, and a lot of young people what are they writing what they write about these things so uh, yeah Excellent. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so speaking of words and and terms, uh, my uh, my team, my editor just mentioned to me that it's uh, adopt and adapt. So I just messed those words. <laughs> Wanted to to mention that it was adopt, not adapt. So please stay okay. tuned with me. So you are watching to Peace Mindedly, a podcast show featuring peaceful bridge makers. And uh, it's uh, this show is, uh, we are live streaming our show on many social media channels, very easy to find on many uh, podcast channels, very easy to find. And also if you do miss a podcast, 
podcast, please visit Goldtune, G-O-L-T-U-N-E, goldtune.com. It's a website, a peace journalism website that I run with a talented group of editors and correspondents to cover peace journalism. When you go to Goldtune, make sure to sign up for our newsletter. We send out weekly newsletters about uh, our show and about what's happening within our uh, peace journalism uh, hubs, if you if you will. And then also, please feel free to submit your questions and comments. We are here to feature them and uh, present them to our guests. So coming up next Tuesday, we are talking to Medina Tenur Whiteman, author of The Invisible Muslim, Journeys Through Whiteness and Islam. Medina's memoir and autobiography about her experience growing up white and Muslim in Europe is also um, 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 according to a Publishers Weekly, is a very honest account that is gaining momentum uh, within the um, uh, readers who are interested in learning about convert, uh, converting to Islam, and also what is what it really means to be uh, a Muslim from a non non uh, Middle Eastern or non Arab or non Turkish backgrounds. So I think it's, uh, I mean, I'm reading the book and quite enjoying it. For the following Tuesday, we will discuss terror, hope and resilience. Terror and Hope, The Science of Resilience with filmmaker Ron Burke and scientist Rana Dajani. The movie follows scientists and humanitarians as they combine research know-how and established care methods to heal Syrian refugee children traumatized by devastating stress of war. So uh, Rana, um, Dr. Dajani is using a very advanced uh, medical research to, to measure uh, ways in which um, uh, kids are uh, responding to the stress against the war. And then throughout uh, her study, she found that uh, these kids are developing a, 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 a method, so to speak. We are going to talk about method and what they do, but a method to be resilient and still stay happy. Uh, even within the in, in refugee camp and after too much loss in in their lives, so we are going to learn a great deal about uh, about this study. And right after that, we are talking with Olga Meking, uh, author of Nixon, embracing the Dutch art of doing nothing. And don't you love that? The art of doing nothing. You know this guilt free of doing nothing and not taking yourself and anything too serious. I think we, we truly, we truly need in this pandemic and it's what's going on outside. We do need to just, you know, be a bit more relaxed and, and not take anything and everything too seriously. So I think we're going to have so much fun talking with Olga. Uh, back to this hour, we're talking to Eileen Mari Tripp, chair of the Department of Gender and Women's Studies and author of Seeking Legitimacy, why Arab autocracies adopt women's rights, and Fatima Sidigi, uh, Fatima Sidigi, linguist and specialist in gender and women's studies, and author of Moroccan feminist discourse. Okay, ladies. So I um I would like to know, in your opinion, how what. How, what has been Islam's influence in the region and how women really took that influence to interpret within their within the women's movement? I, I want to know the Islam influence in the region. So who would like to go first, I wonder? I'll let Fatima go. Okay, yeah. Fatima, go, well, that's, go ahead. that's an easy question for me because... Um, it so happened that um, together with uh, students, I think 12 or 13 students, we uh, conducted a big survey in the, in the Fez region uh, with the simple question, what does Islam mean to you? So we, we talked to um, uh, non-literate women, so we had to ask them orally. We um, prepared questionnaires for educated ones. We interviewed um, um, some authors and so on. And the gist of that, if uh, according to what uh, we um, we analyzed the, the, the questions, etc., the answers, and the Islam means faith. 
<coughs> for many women as a personal relationship with something God, Allah. It means faith for um, uh, the biggest person, the biggest portion of women. It means culture. I am born Muslim. It's like the color of my skin. There's nothing I can do about it, whether I go to the mosque or not. Uh, if uh, it's not, a, it's, that's not the question. But if you uh, say that I am not Muslim, I may take it as an insult. This is um, sort of summing it up. Or politics, you, uh, you use Islam to uh, get political power. So it means all these things. But um, one thing, I mean, <clears throat> surveys are what they are. But Islam, I mean, historically and uh, today, it, it has a big influence uh, on women, uh, on society, on the feminist movement, on the feminist discourses, it's. <clears throat> I don't. Um, I don't think there has been a, a feminist who attacked Islam directly. So Islam is accepted. It's uh, just the way you deal with it, uh, whether uh, you deal with it as. Um, there are women who take it as they. They don't practice, but it's a human right. It's uh, religious freedom. I want to be Muslim, full stop. And uh, there are people who want to separate between the two, but we are in a very comfortable position where the king is at the same time the highest political and religious uh, power. So uh, what I'm talking about is what happens at the level of society, not at the level of, uh, of politics. Excellent, excellent. Aili, why would you think that we should care about what's going on within uh, the Maghreb uh, region in terms of women's rights? Why should we care about? I mean, seeking legitimacy, why Arab autocracies adopt uh, women's rights? So we are talking about that, but why should we care about what's going on with women's rights in, in the Maghreb? I think that uh, we should care about people all over the world, and uh, I think that in um, you know there's so because there's so many interesting things happening uh, in this region. I think that it's it's and like we said before, it's it's been uh, perhaps um, less exposed to the rest of the world, and so I um, I think it's it's really important. But I think it's also important as Americans because here, if you listen to the discussion about. Um, the Middle East and, and North Africa and, and Muslim countries, people just generalize. They throw everybody, everything into one big boat. They talk about the Muslim world and the, and the um, you know, Arab world as though it's just one big <laughs> entity. And there are huge differences. And so even in this, in this issue of Islam, um, even, he, even here, um, you'll find that um, even though people, there aren't, when, when you look at the, for example, Arab barometer surveys and compare the regions, there aren't big differences in, in uh, adherence to Islam and, and praying and, and going to mosque and so on, but between, between the Maghreb and Middle East, but you do see differences in, again, in the legal realm. Um, so- What for, are the differences in legal realm? Yeah, for, so for example, you have um, almost all of the constitutions in the Maghreb, I mean, sorry, in the Middle East, are um, have the, the Islamic law as the basis of the law. And even though the law in the Maghreb countries is influenced by, in particular, Maliki um, law, uh, um, a school of Islamic law, it, it the constitution is the basis of the, of the law, and, and in particular law that has to do with the family, family law and, and personal status code. So that's a big difference. The only other countries in um, outside of these the Maghreb countries are uh, Lebanon and Iraq, and those are the only two other countries that that have the constitution as the basis of of law. So it's a it's a you know it's a difference, and it and it it has implications for how family law is is modified and changed. It's much easier in in these three countries. So we are saying that constitutional law, if uh, the these countries are not based on the constitutional law, what are they based uh, for their argument against women's rights? It's not so much against women's rights, but it's it 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 has to do with the way that they see you know the polygamy, for example, mm -hmm. or. Um, the right of inheritance and so on. It's much more, much more restricted. I would say even the issue of inheritance is still an issue in the, in the Maghreb, um, but it's becoming, at least it's being discussed and it's being 
um, challenged and women's organizations are taking it up now in a way in a way that you don't see in other parts of the the, the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that um, because I am just listening and learning and reading, just wanted to make sure that I understood. So when we are saying, uh, you were saying that these countries, these Maghreb countries, uh, some of them, their laws are based on constitutional law. Mm -hmm. And some of them are not based on constitutional law. So if are if they are not based on constitutional law, what are they based of? Like Islamic or religious? Yeah, or? various interpretations of various um yeah, Sharia Sharia law, but Sharia law. interpretations of it. It it does influence the constitution in these other countries as well, the, and in particular the Maliki school. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that it's not the basis the way it is in in uh the, the most of the Middle East countries, and so you know it has it has implications for the, the ability to change laws. Um, it's much harder um, to change laws that would affect uh, women women's personal status. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent. So I would like to bring uh, Fatima into our, our discussion, and I'm thinking, um, is what Eileen is saying true? Is this going to really make it difficult uh, to change um, um, uh, women's status if we are arguing about if uh, did I understood it? Uh, uh, did I understand correctly? So is it going to make it more difficult for women? Uh, well, I can speak for Morocco. <clears throat> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Morocco, the, the family law is based on the constitution, on Maliki law, but also on the French, Napoleon, whatever, the, the French law. And um, uh, what uh, uh, was um, sidelined was the, the Berber law, okay, mm -hmm. which uh, created a problem during whatever the Berber. The, here, etc. But the the constitution, <clears throat> I think it's it's a mixture of the constitution and and the law because the law is how we, how you interpret Sharia. That's what law is, and the family law is at the center of that. Uh, when you talk about Sharia, about ishtihad interpretation, it means that uh, you adopt. Uh, some Sharia, but the last word is, is constitution. But it does not mean that the law does not exist. It's still there. This is what I think. But we, because we have been struggling with with the law since independence, mm -hmm. so we I want wonder. To change it. So I wonder. Uh, 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 I, I wonder. So when the revolution was happening in Iran, it was just this big discussion about uh, a women movement, uh, the family uh, changes in family law changes, and then everything all of a sudden started. Um, I mean, the the political hier hierarchy started talking about Sharia law. Um, I mean, influencing and injecting Sharia law within the constitution and just basically drafting a new constitution. So I wonder, in your opinion, why uh, why we why family law and women get um, the most attention uh, when these things, these changes happen? Because that's the basis of the community, first. Uh, Second, mm -hmm. but because it's the the most, uh, uh, let's say, it's the weakest, I would say, uh, space uh, in which you can make this confusion between Sharia and Fiqh. Fiqh is uh, Islamic jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. that's, th that's the place where you can really put the two there and leave them uh, very confused uh, there. But when you separate them, Sharia, what is Sharia? If you open a dictionary, Sharia means a path that leads you to water. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. It's just guidelines. But uh, fiqh, the, the law is man-made. It's how men, uh, uh, how men, especially men, uh, uh, interpreted Sharia. And now what women want, they want also their uh, their share of this interpretation. This is what they want. They say because, <clears throat> I mean, if a woman was involved in in the making of the law, we wouldn't have had polygamy at least. Exactly. So it, it's a man's the, the law. The fiqh is a man's 
patriarchal way of seeing the world not in bad faith but that's that's a, it's a traditional it's very uh, but the, the problem is that we are still using it now but society has changed women now are breadwinners uh, the, the authority of a man as Kiwama, that is having the authority, has changed. Women, the moment women started to have a salary, the whole thing crumbled. I mean, the, these things that the, the uh, ancient fuqaha are saying. That's why this is this is what I like about Islamic feminism, which, uh, but uh, uh, not, not everything in it, I mean, uh, speaks to me. But I like uh, the fact, and they will, I would support the fact that it's it's high time women. I cannot do it because you, you need to be um, knowledgeable of that. But if women are think they are apt to go into this and have this ishtihad interpret, why not? Mm -hmm. This is the domain which is still male dominated. And they think that's where our problems come from. Mm -hmm. But this is not the end of the story. I think we need a reform of Islam also. We need what? And I will make it even more complicated, a reform of reform. Islam, a reform of the law, a reform of Arabic. Because mm -hmm. Arabic is not a mother tongue. I'm talking mm -hmm. about written Arabic. It's a language I love. I like it. But it's not a mother tongue. It's women in Morocco and the region love it. They pray in it. But who understands it? You have to be educated to understand and to understand the language of the law. I have to know the Arabic. Yeah. yeah. So we have uh, this is where um, work needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So Arabic Islam. Mm -hmm. We cannot just ignore them. They are there. It's mm -hmm. we have to work on them as so, a society and as politicians and as um, rulers. Yes. So, I mean, I cannot stop uh, listening to you because I'm learning tremendously. I want to know Eileen's take of why in the any major changes, uh, the family law and women get attacked so severely. I think that uh, it's uh, very much like what Fatim, Fatima said, that the family, and if you look at all the constitutions in the MENA region, I say that the family start out with the family is the basis of the law, so it's a, it's a, it's a central institution, um, but it also symbolizes. I think that the family and, and women in particular, they sim they stand in and they symbolize a lot of things, and and uh, and uh, they represent um, more than just women or women's rights. It's it's also a, a stands in for attitudes towards modernity, towards towards pr people's understanding of progress. Uh, and so we're, when we talk about women and women's rights, we're talking about a lot more than just <laughs> women. <laughs> and uh, and so that's why I think also that you find that um, what, what surprised me very often was that you would go to an event and you'd see almost as many men. Fatima, for example, has organized big, huge uh, fora of, of all people from all different parts of the women's movement, feminist movement, all different, and brings them all together every year to talk about a certain topic. And you'll find you know, a large number of men there. Um, she's educated. She was one of the pioneers in educating, uh, uh, in doing it, working in gender women's studies in Morocco. And I, I run, everywhere I went in Morocco, I'd run into her students and half of them were men, <laughs> maybe even more. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, and so I, and the reason, and I ask myself, why? Why so many men are interested? And I think it's because, because it has it has to do with more than just um, women. <laughs> that it has to do with the society as a whole and its future and where it's going. And so, um, I mean, at least I think that's part of the explanation. But we've Fatima and I've debated this also. <laughs> um, why, why that's the case? Excellent. Okay. Excellent. So um, the the book uh, Seeking Seeking Legitimacy: Why Arab Autocracies Adopt Women's Rights is the new book. is uh, is out. Uh, uh, Professor Eileen Mari Tripp. I I mean when I, I I I read the book, I didn't finish the book because it's like a, a scholarly uh, book written about the region, about uh, women, and about feminism movement. What's happening in the Maghreb? So I. 
I cheated. So I read a few first uh, pages and then I read a few last pages to just get ready for the for the show. But I'm gonna read the book because I I enjoy it. I enjoy it. Oh, nice. There you go. I swear Excellent. I read it twice. Yeah. <laughs> also, wait, for, for a week, I, I, I have to read at least two, three books. So, but I'm going to go back and read the book. Please right. stay, stay put with me for a second. So we, you are watching to Peace Mindedly, a podcast show featuring peaceful bridge makers. For this hour, we talked to Professor Eileen Mari Tripp, um, professor of gender and women's studies and author of Seeking Legitimacy, Why Arab Autocracies Adopt Women's Rights. Rights, and Fatima Siddiqui, linguist and specialist in gender and women's studies with the focus on North Africa and larger Middle East. You know the deal for our show, at the end of every program we ask our guests to share uh, something meaningful about peace, kindness and compassion. Uh, a statement, a childhood story, a story, prayer, whatever that they feel uh, they would like to share. One of the reasons, as I explained, I grew up in revolution and war and uh, and I've seen many, many war, um, war scenes. So I truly believe that what we are going through with the pandemic, it's a war-like situation. And during the war, we need... <laughs> We need and we must have peace and we need kindness. Therefore, we are um, projecting peace and kindness in our program. I would like to start with Fatima and then I go with Aili about sharing something meaningful about peace. Yes, Fatima. Ah, something meaningful about peace. Peace, uh, well, uh, I think with this pandemic and um, uh, as a follow-up of this very nice discussion that uh, the three of us had today, I think that uh, this is for me a uh, piece. I mean, when you, you, when you speak to people across religion, across um, difference, across a lot of things, and, uh, uh, and you make yourself understood and you understand, for me, that gives me a lot of personal peace. And uh, personally, I find a lot of peace in research in these things. And uh, in the pandemic, I have read more books than before. So I hope, I mean, this makes some sense. Absolutely. Thank you, Fatima. Aili. Yes, Aili. Yeah, I would just leave with you with a question. Why is it, and I've done research in throughout Africa and uh, and different parts, like I said, in, in North Africa. And one of the things that I've discovered is that women have this tremendous capacity to work across differences, uh, ethnic, religious, racial, uh, different class differences. And I've seen this, you know, all, all over in, and you've seen it in yet Libya and Yemen in Syria, um, but also Liberia, uh, Uganda uh, and uh, Angola. And so my question is, you know, why women, why, why have women, why do women have this capacity? It's not everywhere, but, but um, we see it's often enough that um, it's worth asking the question. So thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, Fatima, um, Martin is asking. So, could you please name? Uh, she she is, uh, she has a, always interested in uh, these areas. Please name some of the Islamic feminist books that you suggest we read. Do you do you know Do you know any title in your in your mind? In English or. Yes, in uh, English. In English. Or the, the, the feminists themselves, like authors. Islamic feminists. About North Africa or Islamic, like um, um, contemporary? Uh, yes, yes, contemporary. I mean, you were saying that they're doing really great work. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I like uh, Munira Sharad. Okay. She was the first one to really explain the... Um, what happened, why the family law, why the state. She made the relationship between women's rights, the state and the tribes. I think Munira Sharad, she teaches at Texas University. Mm -hmm. I think she's good. And now you have Aili also, you have her book. Yeah. Who else? <clears throat> um, Val Mugaddam, 
also. I like her work. Val. Okay. Val. She's Iranian. American. <laughs> oh, Iranian. Well, yes. But, uh, but she wouldn't call herself an Islamic feminist. She's... Uh, uh, oh, about Islamic feminism. Yeah. About Islamic feminism. So sorry. I, I forgot that about Islamic feminism. Oh, Asma Lamrabat. Right. It's good. Okay. She writes in French. Asma Lamrabat. Sorry, I skipped the Islamic. I so I, if you could I, just uh, email, I mean, in, in, yeah. I, I send an okay. email, so then you reply, so we can we can yeah, put it in our program. I'm sure that uh, Mateen's uh, question probably probably might be mm -hmm. other people's question yeah. about uh, interested to know who are the Islamist yeah, we, uh, feminists. We can post that later. No, well. really, yes, Ziba Mir Husseini. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. I will, I will, that was okay. Sure. But Thank you so much. North Africans, because they are not known. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Well, they should be. <laughs> so I do again uh, seeking legitimacy. Why Arab autocracies need um, autocracies adopt women's rights? Eileen uh, Mari Trip. It's it's been an honor to have you, and also Fatima Sadiq. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the discussion, and it was very rich. Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, good night, goodbye, Khoda Hafiz. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.